Hello, good evening to you and welcome to News 360. We are live from the News Hub here at Adesoe, Kanda. I'm Natalie Ford. And my name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up in the bulletin tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by... Government terminates 11 power purchase agreements. Food and Drugs Authority, FDA, rounds up 16 street drug vendors in a special operation in Accra. Also, leadership of private sector high schools say 50% of its members will be out of business if government does not rope them in the free SHS program. As Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark Prematurity Day, we explore interventions being put in place to save the lives of preterm babies. And in business this evening, we find out how the Bono Ahafo region is positioning itself to benefit from government's initiative to revive the poultry industry. And on international front, Zimbabwe's president, Robert Mugabe, makes his first public appearance since the army took over on Wednesday. Uh, and we'll bring you all these and more together with some entertainment news and some sports news as well here in the next 60 minutes on News 360. Feel free to join us with the views. Our first story this evening, 11 power purchase agreements with a combined capacity of 2,808 megawatts of power are to be terminated. Seven others are to be deferred. The Minister of Energy, Boche Jaco, says government stands to make significant savings of more than $7 billion over a 13-year period. According to the Energy Minister, 26 out of 30 power purchase agreements signed by the Electricity Company of Ghana for thermal power projects have been reviewed. The review noted that the projected capacity additions from the PPA were far in excess of the required additions inclusive of a 20% system reserve margin from 2018 to 2030 and would result in the payment of capacity charges for undispatched plants. The committee, according to him, recommended that four of the agreements be deferred to 2018, while three are to be deferred beyond 2025. 11 of the agreements with a combined capacity of 2,808 megawatts are to be terminated. The estimated cost for termination is 402.39 million US dollars, compared to the average annual capacity cost of 586 million dollars. Mr. Speaker, this yields an estimated savings of 7.217 billion US dollars over a 13 year period. Meanwhile, the Speaker of Parliament is unhappy over the limited number of copies of the 2018 budget statement to members. Professor Michael Quay has directed leadership of the House to ensure that members get copies before they leave for Kofridia for a post-budget workshop. Honourable members will be gathered tomorrow in Kofridia. They must have studied and work on these documents. We want to be seen as working, and we are interested in working. The documents must be available. The workshop is to give members better insight of the policy to be able to participate in the post-budget debate effectively. Well, so it's a clear concern that the speaker expresses about they having the document to be able to debate. Now, there have been questions about why the names of uh, the 11 power purchase agreements and the companies were not mentioned. What we do know, what we are getting from our sources, uh, the energy ministry, is that there is a confidential clause in the agreements which prevents government from, from naming them, at least for a two-year period. We're keeping an eye on that and we'll definitely let you know. But we can also say for sure that the operational purchase agreements, the operational power purchase agreements, which are already uh, ongoing, 
are not going to be terminated. That we can say for sure. I need you to follow me closely because I'm just going to run you through some information that the Voter River Authority has on its website with respect to VRA's installed generation capacity. In terms of our consumer, now the installed capacity, 1,002. We have a dependable capacity of about 900 megawatts, and that is hydro. The same as POM, which is, has the dependable capacity of 140 megawatts. Aside the uh, installed capacity of 160 megawatts, we have TAPCO 1 and TICO 2, T2, with 330 megawatts installed capacity, but 300 and uh, 320 megawatts respectively as its dependable capacity. TACRA 3, that's T3, 132 megawatts of installed capacity and also dependable capacity of 120 megawatts. What we can say for sure is that on the VRA website, the installed generation capaci capacity, when it comes to the VRA installed generation capacity, is 2,456 megawatts. That's the total installed capacity by the Volta River Authority. Now, when you look at the independent power producers, that the IPPs and other plants, the installed capacity for the IPPs, we have Bui Hydro with an installed capacity of 400 megawatts. The dependable capacity is about 340 megawatts. A Mary Power Plant, 250 megawatts, with a dependable capacity of 140 megawatts. Car Power Badge, 225, but with additional 427 that's come on board. Sonar Nasogli Phase 1 and Sonar Nasogli Phase 2, all also coming up with 180 megawatts. So there's clearly a little over, as we see here, 1,925 megawatts of installed capacity by the independent power producers, adding up to the 2,000 thereabout of what the Volta River Authority has also installed. It's clear that there is more uh, than what we are even demanding at peak because at 1,900 megawatts, that's what we're told uh, that we have in terms of the peak. Kojopoku is uh, an energy expert. He joins me on Skype to help us understand what the implications of this is. Kojo, good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Is it indeed a, a prudent decision to take considering the current power situation we have in the country? Hello, Kojo? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very clearly. Now, I'm, I'm asking if we're, we're, oh, okay. Yes, I'm asking if it is a prudent decision to take, considering the current situation we have with respect to uh, a power in the country. Well, yes. Um, we all know the backstory to this, which is basically the government telling us that in the past, there were companies who had PPAs, and these PPAs were what you call take or pay. The take or pay became a bit of a problem because it means that all those PPAs that were signed, if those companies were to make their plans operational, if government does not even need okay, the electricity, right. could you, I'm we gonna, still have to pay them. Like could you, hold on a bit. I'm going to come back to you, um, Mr. because there's a little technical hitch with your connection. But we'll reconnect with you again so we have some clarity with what you're saying. Let's go on to 20 by 20 tonight. Do you know the status of uh, you know the constitutional review process that was started under President uh, Mills? Where's it gotten to? The Constitutional Review Commission. Yes. Where they presented their report and pro uh, asked that a committee, an implementation committee, be appointed so that the processes which we had to go through and make the amendments come through were dealt with. I have to say that when they finished their work with their report, they actually had a set of bills ready to be sent to Parliament. But I believe the implementation committee also did certain changes which had not been recommended by the Review Commission. It was a great work. They did a wonderful work. But then politics, I believe, set into it. And I cannot say anything as far as that is concerned. What isn't working that you believe 
we change for the better and would amount to progress? Well, to me, we have to reform our educational system. To me, it's very, very vital mm. that we understand the value of education and change our educational system. Okay. I don't know, I don't know how far you interact with young people going to school, but some of them, when you're speaking with them, you realize that, do they think? And sometimes it makes you sad, because the ability to think must start from a very young age. Mm. And if you don't learn to think if you are young, when you grow up, you won't think properly. Then also, I think we have to lay emphasis on the structure of the curricula we use in these schools. It's very, very important. One of the things which I would want to change is the system in which we consider a foreign language. And I have to stress it, that English is a foreign language to us. What are we doing? so that if you, I don't know whether you are a can or ever where you come from, but if a girl meets somebody from the north, what language are they going to speak? They speak English. Why? Unfortunately, that's our official and national language. Why should it be our official and national language? They speak Swahili in the parliament in Tanzania. Why can't we do it here? Let's go back to Skype now. Could you, uh, now, I was asking if, uh, is it the case that we're out of the woods yet so uh, we can actually do away with this for the time being? Yes, um, yeah, is it better now? Hello? Yes, it's, it's better. Yeah, it's, can you hear me? I can hear you very clearly. It's better now, please. Okay, now what I was saying, what I was saying is that most of the PPAs that have been signed, you know, during the peak of the Doomsaw, the government in the haste to try and solve the Doomsaw signed a lot of PPAs. Now, most of them did not perform and did not come operational within the time that they said they would do. So you realize that there was about 5,000 megawatts of PPA that has been signed, and most of them didn't even have the money to break the ground. So what, and in, within those PPAs, the power purchase agreement, one of the noticeable thing was, there's this thing called take or pay. The take or pay means that if those plants were built and government does not need them, we still have to pay them the capacity charge though we don't take the electricity. So now that we have access in the system, and um, right now, if you look at the peak load on the Gridco um, website, it's around 2,000, uh, the peak load is about 2,000, and we have available generation is about 2,600. So you can see that with the available load, there's about 600 megawatts even this evening, which the peak load is 2,000. So we seem to have excess capacity as we speak. So what government has done is to basically abrogate the PPAs that we do not need or they have not performed within the time that they, they say they are going to perform. Now, those that are happy to change the PPA to take and pay. Take and pay means that if they build a power plant, the government will only pay them when they do need the power from them. Now, they have been deferred to 2023, 2024. Okay, so that is the reorganization that has happened in the power sector. Great. Kujo, thank you very much for this, and I'm grateful for your time as always. Have a great evening. Kojo Poko is an energy expert joining us with his thoughts on this. Yes, Alfred. But let's now turn to other stories this evening as the National Identity Register Bill has been passed. The bill is to amend some aspects of the National Identification Authority Act 2007, Act 707, to bring in tune with modern trends. It's also to ensure accuracy and integrity of Ghana's identification system. The bill has seven clauses, which, among other things, eliminates the requirement of the minimum age for registration.
Now, the Food and Drugs Authority has rounded up 16 street drug vendors in a special operation in Accra. The multi-agency joint operation targeted unauthorized drug dealers, unregistered drugs and sale of drugs outside designated sale points. See this one, like this one, I'd buy, I'd buy 25. If you go, why you go, Lorian? 24-year-old Musa Mamadou claimed he started selling drugs years ago in Ghana because of hardship. He has a variety of drugs, including soda water, which he claimed can cure piles, malaria, waist and body pains, pimples, fever and gonorrhea. Some of Musa's drugs can only be used by ladies. Well, like me, myself, I don't want to sell this one because I know I have money the way they change it. Musa gets his stock from Tudu, Accra, but was unable to describe the exact location. 28-year-old Kwesi Boating, who is unemployed, was one of the two Ghanaians apprehended during the swoop. According to him, he used to be a beggar until a friend introduced him to the business of selling dewormers. Kwesi lives at La Paz but conducts his business at Medina. These activities, the FDA says, is a concern as they infringe on public health and safety issues. The joint operation with the police, CEPs, BNI and Yoko, was to discourage the unauthorized sale of drugs and unregistered products. The operation again targeted the indiscriminate sale of tramadol, which the FDA says has led to gross abuse among the youth. Which has been established that is being used by our youth, especially students, and is creating a whole lot of problems, comes to a halt. Tramadol is a painkiller. But why is the FDA worried about its usage? The one that you find on the market currently is around 200 milligram apples, which has not been approved by the FDA. Secondly, it's been established that it is something that is being abused, and we want to discourage that. That is why, that's one of the reasons why this particular group was organized, to make sure that we deal with the dealers of these products. So what next after this exercise? What we want to do is that, yes, we will continue to embark on such exercise to make sure that we make this business uncomfortable. Things that people not easily go into it. That's what we want to do. But aside that, we want to major on education for the general public to understand and appreciate the reason why they don't have to patronize products from such places. 16 people were rounded up Thursday night, 14 of them foreigners and two Ghanaians. All 16 have been handed over to the police for further investigations. It is a good development, at least. Uh, the FDA is clamping down on these people. Yeah, they sell the lorry stations, people buy it innocently, mm -hmm. and then they... I think that only two are Ghanaian. That's quite worrying. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that's it. But let's go on. Still staying with issues relating to human health, Ghana is ranked 25th in the world for the number of babies born prematurely. This is because more women are giving birth to preterm babies. As Ghana joins the rest of the world to mark Prematurity Day, Esebenewa Otu puts the spotlight on this serious health crisis. Preterm, according to the World Health Organization, are babies born alive before 37 weeks of pregnancy are completed. Common causes of preterm include multiple pregnancies, infections and chronic conditions such as diabetes and high blood pressure. It is the leading cause of deaths in the first month of a life of a baby. Worldwide, one in three new birth deaths are due to preterm birth complications. Every year, an estimated 15 million babies are born preterm and this number is rising. Almost 1 million children die each year due to complications of preterm birth. These babies lie here. They are among the 140,000 babies born prematurely every year in Ghana. As they lie in here struggling to survive, there's much call for support for mothers who give birth prematurely. 54% of babies born at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital were born prematurely in the first quarter of this year alone. 7% were extreme preterm, 13% very low birth rate, and 34% low birth rate. 
Dr. Okai Brako is a member of the Pediatrician Society of Ghana and a pediatrician at the Greater Accra Regional Hospital. Prematurity has come to stay with us, but they have a future because we've seen so many NICUs springing out, up out, around the country. Almost every region is having something to do with babies. And we call on our obstetricians to have a comprehensive package for antenatal care. Some of the preterm babies, he said, are referred from other facilities and need special care. Dr. Frederick Amonu manages preterm babies in the contagious unit. And then we review every day. So we provide other conditions, other services for the baby to thrive. So when the baby gets to around 36 weeks, 37 weeks, which by then the baby would have, uh, if to be in the mother's womb, would have been mature enough to come out to be able to withstand the outside environment. At that time, the baby can now be made to come out or be discharged to the mother to go home for the mother to continue with management. Babies are the neonatal unit of the hospital are supported by the pediatric nurses who attend to them by the minutes to ensure their survival. They are high dependent babies, so it means that their conditions are critical. So it means either they are on the ventilator or oxygen. So you need to be checking every now and then if there is anything going wrong. The increasing number of preterm babies calls for a major push to reduce these deaths if Ghana wants to reach the global goal to end all preventable newborn and child deaths by 2030. And this is certainly a very, very worrying situation, the issue of preterm babies. As we know, Ghana has not achieved Millennium Development Goal 4 due to preterm babies. Now, the preterm births in Ghana, I'm going to run us by some pretty staggering statistics, in fact. 18 newborn babies die daily before reaching the, the first month. That's in Ghana specifically. 18 newborn babies die before reaching the first month. Approximately 29,000 newborn deaths are recorded every year in Ghana. Now, 140,000, which is 14% of babies, are born premature annually. In Ghana still, this, these statistics are specifically related to Ghana, 8,400 preterm babies die before reaching 30 days, while one newborn baby dies hourly due to premature, prematurity. Now, we know that obviously the issue of having enough incubators at hospitals will help this to a large extent, but the issue of teenage pregnancy is also something that needs to be curbed and educating young girls in this regard. Some key interventions that have been raised that can be made is the prevention of adolescent pregnancy and care during pregnancy. Care during pregnancy definitely includes skilled delivery and early initiation as well as exclusive breastfeeding which is not practiced by all mothers and that's pretty concerning. And care during pregnancy as well as exclusive breastfeeding, early postnatal care and proper management of preterm complications which include breathing difficulties as well as infections. So the problem here is that we have not achieved Millennium Development Goal 4 which has to do with reducing child mortality largely do to preterm babies offered. Absolutely the case. But away from the private senior high schools recorded a 20% drop in their intake for September this year due to the implementation of the free senior high school program. Its leadership says 50% of its members will be out of business if government does not include them in the policy for the next academic year. National President of the Conference of Heads of Private Second Cycle Schools Chops, I.K. Mensah, spoke to TV3 in Accra. The free senior high school program absorbed more than 40,000 students into the public senior high schools. The situation affected the intake of students into private senior high schools. In April this year, the leadership of the private senior high schools petitioned the Ministry of Education to address their concerns. But the Ministry of Education ignored them. They have recorded a drop of about 20% in their intake due to the implementation of the free SHS program. Available figures indicate that there are 280 private senior high schools across the country with 10,000 lecturers. These lecturers receive an average salary of 500 cities monthly while they contribute 60 million cities to GDP. It also has student population of 50,000 nationwide. 
leadership of the private senior high schools, called on government to include them in the free SHS program for the next academic year. I know we have the listening government. And in fact, our president, His Excellency Nana Dudam Kukufadu, is a listening president. And it wouldn't be, and he will not allow the history of Ghana to be written that private school that started years, years ago collapsed during the reign of private, you know, um, His Excellency the President. He wouldn't have his name written in that black you know, book. Though some educationists have complained about private senior high schools charging exorbitant fees, its leadership disagrees. You see, my initial admission here is 903 for boys. Subsequent terms, we pay 675. Just look at that. Boarding, including the feeding and all ancillary payments. So if, Ghana, if the government gives me that, even if it's 1,000 Ghana, I should be rather happy. Why would I charge more? Even with 675, we are able to manage our schools and churning out qualitative what you know students. It has pleaded with government to consider giving them subsidies and warned its members to also improve on their facilities. My colleague private schools must also be up and doing. Hmm. There are private schools me myself I would not be so proud of. That is why we want the ministry and the Ghana Education Service to liaise with the chops or conference of heads of private schools so that Private schools, not everybody says, um, is saying, oh, it, you know, we should have free SHS. No. Meanwhile, the Minister of Education, Dr. Macho Poko Prempe, has indicated plans to hold talks with the leadership of private senior high schools on the matter. Well, it's something well, government has been yes, considering, yeah, especially with I, the I, it's overcrowding in some concern. of the pu public SHS, you know, flow them to the private. But you're still live here on News 360. We'll be back with some business news. Do stay. You buy. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Time for business with me, Nanikia Mensah-Bampa. Good evening. The Minister for Finance, Ken Oforiata, has stated the 2018 budget seeks to improve livelihood of livestock farmers in all 10 regions and also increase meat production. Bonahafu region is the hub of poultry production in the country. But how is the region pos positioning itself to benefit from the agriculture Mashal plan? Under the 2018 budget, 2,000 livestock farmers will be supported with 70,000 sheep and goats. Government will also support six national livestock breeding stations to produce and distribute 200 crossbreed young cows, 1,700 improved pigs and 100,000 cockerels. In Ghana, the demand for poultry products as a source of protein has increased steadily over the last three decades and will continue over the next three decades. Poultry farming is one area that a country has a comparative advantage in the sub-region. There are over 200 poultry farmers in Bonahafu alone, but how is the region positioning itself to benefit from the huge markets and government agriculture interventions? 19 districts in the region are to benefit from the one district, one factory. Under the one district, one factory, the poultry industry in Bonahafo is going to be revamped. And Doma area, Techima area, all those in the poultry industry who submitted their proposals to one district, one factory office this year, the funds are going to be disbursed. Two million dollars each. And so the poultry industry, they are going to benefit from, from that. Deputy Bonahafo Regional Minister Evans Poku Bobie is of the view the employment of agriculture extension officers is critical for increased production. 10,000 youths are going to be recruited and trained in the agricultural extension services to go to our farmers and teach them how to do more than farming. Productivity of the farmers will go up. Coming from the Bonahafo area, which is a pure agricultural region, the agri sector is going to be revamped through the agricultural extension services and then the poultry sector as well. He noted the poultry industry in the Bonahafo region will benefit from the eventual increase in grain production in the form of animal feed. 
Opokubobie suggested access to low-cost and long-term credit and improved efficiencies at key stages of the poultry value chain. He called for training for poultry farmers to increase their capacity, which he noted is crucial for growth in the poultry industry. The Deputy Regional Minister indicated increased competitiveness of the Ghana poultry sector, improved profitability, expand national and regional trade, and in sector-related inputs and service markets are key for sustainable poultry industry. Now, President Kufuado, as part of his three-day official visit to Qatar, met with the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. The discussions between the two leaders centered on energy, infrastructural development, railways, and roads. The Emir of Qatar is set to visit Ghana from December 27 to December 29, 2017. He told President Kufuado he was keen for Ghanaian companies to invest in Qatar. Sheikh Hamim bin Hamad Al Athani indicated Qatar was desirous of forging strong partnerships and relations with countries such as Ghana. On his part, President Ikufuadu was grateful for the warm reception and hospitality accorded him and his delegation. Ghana, with its gas resources, the president noted, was willing to learn from Qatar on how it's exploited its gas resources for the development of the country. President Ikufuadu was hopeful. Ghana would have established an embassy in Qatar and have an ambassador prior to the visit of the Emir. Let's talk measures now. And the CEO of Airtel, Tigo Roshi Motman, says the measure of the two telcos will provide customers with a major boost in both rural and urban network coverage, translating into better voice quality and high-speed data services. Speaking to TV3 Business, she said recruitment has begun for the top-level management positions, after which staff positions will be looked at department by department. Airtel and Tigo first announced in March 2017 their intention to merge, which will be the second largest mobile network operator in the country. Eight months down the line, major plans are taking shape as the regulator, the National Communications Authority, has given its approval. The two companies have begun integration to harmonize their operations with the announcement of its new brand name, Airtel Tigo. The CEO of Airtel Tigo, Roshi Motman, says combining the resources and services of the two companies will result in the delivery of greater value to Ghanaians. You will continue to enjoy the services you have if you're an Airtel customer and you will continue to enjoy the services if you're a Tigo customer. The only big difference is that uh, from, from two days ago, um, the, the Airtel to Tigo calls are considered to be one network, which means that it's a huge benefit. Industry watchers and staff of the two companies are apprehensive about the loss of job expected to arise. We are starting from um, the top management. We have just recruited the leadership. And in the next uh, couple of months, um, the levels below will follow department by department. So there are some rumors that some workers have been asked to reapply. It will not be just a jury of three, four people that will be pointing out, you're good, you're not. It will be a very fair and transparent process where indeed we need to build job descriptions. So um, yes, in the end, um, if we cannot offer uh, a job in Airtel Tigo, then it will also come with a redundancy package. Another issue that dominated the major talks was government of Ghana demand to have a stake in the new entity with the NCA giving the approval on that condition. The government of Ghana will have an option to acquire a 25% stake within the next uh, 24 months in the merged entity. Axpair shareholders' agreement, Millicon and Airtel have equal ownership and governance rights in the combined entity. Airtel Tigo is the second largest mobile network operator in Ghana, with a combined customer base of approximately 10 million and 25% market share. My Paul so are there with that report, ending it for the business segment tonight. My name is Nanikia Mensah News 360 continues after this. Good evening.
In her entertainment this evening, she's determined to break whatever spell has been preventing her region from winning the Ghana's most beautiful crown in a very long time. Northern region Zainab is positive about taking the crown this time and says her hard work over the period will pay off. The Northern Region has won the crown just once, and Zainab is poised to redeem the image of her people this year. She has been adjudged the most disciplined contestant in the house, best costumed contestants two times, and not forgetting winning the most eloquent performer award. Winning the crown, however, will be a vindication that she did not come to play in the house. The journey so far has not been easy. It has been tough and stressful. But I, I, I have this thing in my mind that keeps pushing me that I should just work hard. I'm not here as an individual. I'm here to represent my people. So I just need to push a little bit harder and get the crown. So if I get the crown, I'll be grateful to God and make my people proud. She believes life after the pageant will be smooth and impactful with the grooming and advice given her. This, she says, has refined her into a better woman. Regardless of any challenges, especially from the unfriendly social media fraternity, Zainab hopes to make the best out of criticisms to help improve on her personality. With the rate of maternal mortality in her region, she wants to make use of the opportunities presented to her whilst in the competition to help reduce it. If I am not crowned and I've gotten this great opportunity and platform, I'll utilize it wisely to get people to help me with my project, which is to reduce maternal mortality in Northern Region. Though it has been a very tough and challenging 13 weeks, the future philanthropist is ready to accept whatever the verdict will be on Sunday at the finale and wants other contenders in the show to also have the same mindset. We'll yeah. see what happens on Sunday. Absolutely. You right? know, Hiba <laughs> came so close to winning last year. So let's see what happens. Yeah, in she seems region. pretty determined for the North region. Absolutely. But may the best win on Sunday. That's it for the news this evening. On behalf of the rest of the team, we say thank you. My name is Alfred Kansi. And I'm Natalie Fort. We've got more news on our website. That's 3news.com. Remember news at 10 days this evening. We'll simulcast on our sister station.